Welcome. Welcome back to the HP Half Day Track. We've uh, had th three sessions so far that have been great. You know, we've heard from Monty Taylor earlier this afternoon. We've heard from Raj about uh, how we're using OpenStack. And then we had the panel here. And next, we're going to be looking at uh, some of our uh, partner solutions. So first, I'd like to introduce you to uh, Pete Johnson, who's with Clicker. And uh, he's going to tell you about what Clicker is and how that can help you deploy and also benchmark your applications against multiple different cloud providers uh, so you, you can know that you're getting the best value for your dollar. So please give a round of applause to Pete. Thank you. Just so you know, other folks earlier were having mic problems. Is that a little better? We good? Okay. Um, so I'm really excited to be back here at OpenStack. I last got a chance to uh, speak to an OpenStack audience during the San Diego summit when I was still with HP Cloud. And at that time I did a talk called uh, Enterprise to OpenStack, Here's What You're Missing. So it was, it was basically like a laundry list of things that I heard in the field as an HP Cloud sales engineer, which is my job was at the time, about what enterprises felt were missing from OpenStack. And what's happened in the two and a half years since um, is we've seen some of those features get rolled into OpenStack, and we've seen other of those features start to get filled in by ecosystem partners. And that's really what we are at Clicker. We, we build ourselves as application-aware cloud management. We'll, we'll see what that, what that is here in a minute. But at the high level, what we help enterprises do is, is solve this problem of you have all these applications, and maybe they're homegrown, maybe they're brand new, maybe they're off the shelf. Maybe you've already described them in some way, either using cloud formation, CMDB, or Tosca. And you want a way to get them from wherever they are today out onto some mix of an OpenStack cloud. We've, uh, Clicker is about an 18 to 24 month old company, depending upon how you want to count that. Our founders are uh, two guys that work together at VMware and, and solve this problem with, with VMware on you know, what, what can be a, a locked in uh, vendor private cloud stack. And Clicker's been a HP cloud partner and sort of by extension an OpenStack partner uh, since the very beginning. And actually, I, I'm happy to be able to announce today that, that we're actually a, an OpenStack sponsor now as well. <laughs> so up until this point, and, and our guys, as you're going to see here, you're going to see some you're going to see some synergy with what's going on in the Heat project, and our engineering team is looking pretty hard at how we can make some contributions to Heat uh, here moving forward now that, now that we're in the sponsor. But, but what we've done all along is, is take this idea of you've got these applications, now how do I get them to run on these clouds? In, in the early days of doing cloud and trying to get applications to run on cloud, we saw a, a lot of coding and, and kind of scripting approaches to launching machines, doing some uh, custom configuration management with the chefs and the puppets of the world. And, and ultimately what you, you, you get up with a lot of that is you get some cloud lock-in. And even if you, your script developers are smart enough to help you avoid that cloud lock-in, what you end up with is this army of script writers that you have to keep paying over time and it becomes a very expensive proposition. Um, so what we've done with the way that we approach this is really the, the key to this whole thing is this guy right here, this box right here. Uh, some other providers call this templating. We, we call it profiling. So the idea is, you know, whether you have a couple of small, well-known applications or you have a, a, a lot of applications, the average Fortune 500 company has 5,000 applications they're trying to manage at any one time. A lot of times those are legacy applications that you don't know anything about, so you have to do kind of image snapshotting, kind of uh, lift and shift of those things. Regardless of how you do that, you, you create this thing we call an application profile. And it's a cloud agnostic description of what the infrastructure needs are of that application. So you can either import that from your existing set or we have a, an app store that we've already done that for commonly used open source applications like Sugar CRM, Drupal, Joomla, MediaWiki, all the ones that you'd think that you would do. So once you have that application profile, what you ha now have is the ability to portably move, uh, to portably deploy applications on whatever cloud you want. Now we're talking about primarily here the OpenStack based ones today. I mentioned VMware earlier. We, we support a, a lot of different cloud vendors, 
like I said, the focus here today is the OpenStack ones. The first thing that people typically do once they have that application profile is, is as Cody was talking, they try to ask themselves the question, what's the best cloud for this application? Knowing very well that depending upon the application, you, you might have, you, if you've got 5,000 applications, the, the, you might not get the same answer for two different applications. You might want to run some on an internal private cloud. Maybe you've got data sensitivity issues for some applications, but for others you don't. Maybe some uh, applications are very elastic in their needs and therefore would be better for a public cloud, whereas others are very predictable and might be better uh, in terms of their capacity and might be better for uh, a private cloud. So regardless of, of what that is, we have this benchmarking facility where you can take the application and run it on multiple clouds, get an answer back, not just based on performance, but also based on price, so that you can make an educated decision where to run that application. Once you've made that decision, you can then go to the deployment phase where we actually push the application uh, out into production or maybe it's a dev test workload. And then longer term, uh, this manage where you can get uh, metering information and monitoring information about the application as it's running in production. You can do cloud agnostic auto scaling. So I, I can put into, I can put in to my configuration that, hey, if my CPU utilization gets above 80% or it drops below 50%, I want you to add or subtract nodes from a particular layer of the application. You can do all that from the management aspect of the product. And then we have this governance piece, which helps you enable uh, IT as a service, which we really think is kind of the next big frontier here. There were some talks in the keynotes this morning uh, about shadow IT and about the commoditization or the consumerization of IT services. It's with this governance piece is really how you, you begin to implement that in your organization, where from a central governing authority, typically the corporate IT department, you can set up uh, activation profiles and private application stores such that all your line of business teams can go and when they have some project that comes up and they need a project wiki and they need a calendaring application and they need a, a blog of some kind, they can go to a storefront, an internally facing storefront populated with applications that that central governing IT department has created for them and has tested for them and has put in the, the governance features what clouds they can and cannot run those on and, and lets them launch those applications in a very easy point and click fashion, which we're going to see here in a second. And then there's enough metering and billing in the background that you can do departmental chargebacks so that you know exactly who's spending what where and you have the data that allows you to continue to fund your IT department, but now using self-service on-demand style provisioning instead of what a traditional IT department would do with a, you know, a long kind of year or 18 month cycle to do, to do funding. And then the other thing worth mentioning here is we have a pretty broad set of applications that we support within Clicker. Uh, we're gonna see in the demo, we're gonna queue up here uh, a pretty simple LAMP stack, but we support Rails, all the Java apps you would think, batch mode things like Hadoop, uh, thick clients, high performance compute, and those sorts of things. So let me cut to my can demo here. Let's see. No, that isn't it. Here it is. Here it is. That isn't it. Let's kill this. Let's go back to the file manager. Here we go. So this is our user interface, and you can see there's an apps tab, and I have a number of applications I can choose to launch. I'm gonna click on run here on Drupal, and you can see it's a multi-tier application. In this case, it's, it's a two-tier application. I've got a web tier and a database tier. I've got a description I can put here at the top of what this deployment's gonna be. And um, I'm choosing uh, HP Cloud as the, the target for this. For each of my layers, I can choose what instance type I want for each of those layers. I push the submit button and that's it. 
So for implementing that IP as a service, it, it's, sim it's as easy as that. You can get the whole thing deployed in about three clicks. Now, we'll come back to this screen here that shows the application as it gets deployed. But if we go to this edit screen, we can dive into what our notion of application <coughs> profile is. Now, in the edit mode, you can see we have multiple layers that we can add or subtract from the application. Here we can add or subtract a load balancer. I've got general information here at the top. And then for each layer, I have additional configurations that I can put in here. I, I tell it where my application files are, and we'll see that in our storage mechanism here in a second. I can set up firewall rules. I can dictate minimum hardware requirements for this layer. I can go in, and set up uh, specific initialization or cleanup scripts if I want to provide those. It's kind of the idea where the, the, the defaults are you don't do anything, but you can add and subtract as much of this as you want. The database layer is similar, where we can provide an optional database setup script. And then you have the same kind of mechanism here to do the firewall rules, the minimum hardware requirements, and so forth for that database layer. You would see some of those for the other layers as well. Let's look at this storage. One of the key components to, to cl how Clicker works is we have this cross-cloud secure storage mechanism. You can see here, uh, I'm going to look in my global folder in app, and we're going to look in Drupal. So this is on top of, uh, in HP Cloud's case, on top of, of Cinder and Swift that we've built this. And there's some files here. Specifically, there's that Drupal zip file that if we go back to our application profile, that's the reference to that exact file right there. So I have already pre-uploaded these files into this secure multi-cloud storage facility. And then in the application profile, I simply reference them. Now you can create as many of these, these application profiles as you want, and we offer these sort of default templates for these. Here you can see the, the PHP web one that we built the uh, Drupal one off of. Or I mentioned before we have this public app store where there's all these different applications that are pre-populated uh, application profiles that you can very easily import onto your apps tab and, and then very easily run like we saw a minute ago. So here I'm going to import uh, Bugzilla. And now that's ready to be executed off of my apps tab if I wanted it to be. If we look at that application profile, we can see this one is actually already structured as a three-tier application with a load balancer, some app servers, and a database server. So I mentioned this idea of being able to do cloud agnostic auto-scaling. This is the, the screens where you can do that. I talked about CPU utilization. This one's going to show memory utilization, where every 60 seconds it's going to pull uh, whatever layer I've applied uh, this scaling to. And if the memory utilization is greater than 80%, it will add a node to that layer. If it dips below 50%, it will take one away. So this is completely cloud agnostic. I could run this on, on any OpenStack cloud or any of the other clouds we support. And now this becomes portable. Now if we go back, let's see. And you can see here, uh, the app server is typically one of those that is, uh, you can apply those scaling policies to. If you go into the runs, if you go into start or run, you can see where that is. So now our, our Drupal installation is done. We, uh, we can see here, we've got connection details for uh, each one of these layers. There's one node per layer the way I deployed this. We can SSH into those machines. Clicker doesn't stand in the way of the app as it's running. It simply sort of helps with the deployment on the side. Um, and then we can, this is what the monitoring features look like. These screens aren't terribly exciting because we didn't have any load that was pressed against this, this brand new installation of Drupal. But you can see where you have the things like the memory, the CPU, the disk utilization, and the network utilization that you can look at all from this screen. Um, I didn't, and if we go to the home screen, you get a view across all your cloud deployments, regardless of what clouds they're on. You can see things like your usage details per app, how many active nodes per app. So you get this single pane of glass to look at your deployments across multiple clouds, whether they be public or private. And that's what Clicker is about.
Next, we're going to have Gigaspace come up and talk about their Cloudify application and how you can use Cloudify to uh, help deploy your applications. So, round of applause for Gigaspace, please. Can you hear me? Okay. Hey, so my name is Uri Cohen, and I'm going to take the risk and run a live demo. That's why I switched to computer. Um, and raise your hand if you ever heard about Gigaspaces. All right. Cloudify. Awesome. Okay. Um, so I'm going to start by um, actually um, looking at what it takes to manage applications, specifically complex enterprise applications, on top of uh, the cloud, or for that matter, any data center. Um, and you can see that we have a life cycle that's composed of uh, multiple steps. Um, and it's not just about deploying these applications, it's about running them for their entire life cycle. And we start by provisioning the infrastructure. And typically that includes, uh, most people would think about compute, but we've seen uh, uh, networking being discussed here. Uh, Chris actually uh, did a great job in showing that uh, earlier. Um, and so we're talking about multiple types of resources that are needed for an application, starting from compute, going on to networks, subnets, security groups, key pairs, uh, storage, block storage or blob storage, whatever is needed for your application. Uh, and that's just, that, that's just the provisioning phase. Um, then we have to install or configure those uh, resources, uh, specifically if you're talking about VMs, it's running Chef or Puppet or your own bash scripts on top of them and installing the components that are needed to run your application. Uh, then it's about configuring them um, and deploying your own code. Um, and that too can, uh, can be quite a, a, a complicated process because you have to orchestrate everything. Uh, for example, you won't be able to start your web server before your database starts successfully. Um, and then we're kind of switching into the post-deployment phase of things where you need to monitor things, uh, starting from uh, very basic or, or fundamental KPIs like CPU and memory, uh, but uh, more interestingly, things that are more specific to your application components, like for example, if you're running a web server, the number of concurrent users or sessions, um, and even more interesting than that is business metrics, is for example, uh, how many uh, logins did I have in the last hour, or how many user registrations uh, happened. Uh, once I've set up all this monitoring uh, into my application infrastructure, uh, it's then that I can actually use that information to take, to take proactive steps, uh, whether it's uh, recovering from failures. I can identify failures, for example. Um, starting from the business metrics, I, I'm seeing that the number of registrations has went down uh, without any uh, uh, reasonable explanation, or just identifying that one of the nodes is not responding, so I can fix that and provision more nodes. Um, and the more kind of uh, advanced use cases to scale things, uh, whether doing it proactively based on load or even reactively by identifying specific patterns that are unique to your application and, and basically deciding that you need to scale in a certain time of day or a certain time of the year. Um, and it's kind of a cycle because as you scale or as you recover from failures, you go through this provisioning, installation, configuration, and deployment phase all over again. So that's kind of nice in theory. Uh, but if we look at uh, what's happening in the real life, this is actually taken from a Gartner study that was uh, conducted last year, and it shows that about 80% of the outages uh, impacting mission-critical applications is actually coming from human errors. Okay? It's about um, people making mistakes, obviously, and out of those uh, errors, 50% uh, were actually caused by people applying changes in a way that wasn't structured or ordered. Um, another important thing to, to understand is that most, while most organizations want to be in the step where they can do all this automated orchestration and go through this cycle that I described before, um, about 60% are only beginning to uh, realize the benefits of virtual virtualization. They're not even uh, into cloud yet, uh, OpenStack or other cloud platforms. Uh, some do automation at, at a more basic level, basically configuring individual nodes using Chef or Puppet, for example. Um, and 83% are still not there. They want to be there, but they're not there uh, around uh, complete orchestration. And that's where Cloudify comes in. Um, so Cloudify is, first of all, it's an open source platform licensed under Apache 2. Um, if I would kind of have to uh, choose four things that it does, um, this is where I'd start. Uh, we'll, we'll look at this uh, uh, clockwise. So it starts from provisioning the cloud infrastructure that I mentioned before. Uh, basically, the foundation of Cloudify is a blueprint uh, that I'm going to uh, talk about in a second. 
Uh, so it starts by analyzing what is needed to run your application and provision that on the infrastructure. Um, so if we're talking about OpenStack, again, using uh, the Nova, Nova APIs and the Cinder APIs and the Neutron APIs to provision all those resources. Um, it then orchestrates the creation of those resources and the configuration of your nodes on top of them. And where it gets interesting is that it also wires up everything that's needed to manage your application on an ongoing basis, uh, whether it's monitoring agents. Um, and again, we're not using anything specific to Gigaspaces. We're actually using uh, um, standard open source tools to do all of, these, all of this stuff. Uh, so for monitoring, uh, you typically can use StatsD or CollectD um, or other uh, well-known monitoring agents, uh, which would then push your data uh, into, into Cloudify. Uh, we're also wiring up everything that's related to logging and monitoring your application logs, and we're going to see that in the live demo. Uh, so we're using standard tools like Logstash and Elasticsearch to push your application logs and your uh, platform logs into, into Cloudify and basically uh, take uh, steps on top of them. Um, and then what happens is that we can, using this information, we can actually analyze this information uh, using a, um, basically a, a policy engine. Again, another open source tool called Riemann uh, that basically analyzes all of the information that's submitted from those, uh, from those um, uh, metrics and take proactive steps uh, on top of them. Um, so the main use cases uh, around complicated applications is, first of all, around deployment automation. That's kind of the more trivial use case, basically uh, defining an application blueprint, no matter how complex the application will be, and automating the deployment of that. Uh, that can be done on multiple environments. Uh, specifically, where we're going to see today is, is around the HP OpenStack cloud, uh, but it works on any OpenStack environment, on, of course, and, and, and of course other clouds. So you can take the same blueprint and deploy it on any cloud that you want. Uh, it even works on bare metal installations or traditional data center installations, so you can migrate workloads uh, from a traditional data center to your cloud and vice versa. Um, it's good for auto-scaling auto and failover, so I mentioned a couple of ways to do that, um, whether it's uh, proactively by identifying things that are happening now and reacting to them, um, and even more sophisticated, analyzing those patterns through those metrics that we collect and understanding when it would make more sense to to, um, uh, to proactively scale your application before the load actually takes place. Uh, the other two interesting use cases are upgrading your infrastructure, um, and that too may be a very complex process. So for example, if, you're, uh, if you need to uh, apply a patch, like the hard bleed uh, issue that we had uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, if you want to apply patches to your operating system, you probably don't want to take down your entire uh, environment for that or entire service for that. So you would need to do that in an ordered process, basically one instant, instance at a time. And if something goes wrong, you want to be able to roll that back. So that's kind of a complicated workflow you need to accommodate for. Uh, that's something that Cloudify does really well. Um, and the last one is continuous delivery. Again, this is not something you want to do in one shot. Uh, you typically want to use some sort of policy like a Canary instance um, or uh, apply the change to just a subset of your nodes, uh, checking that everything goes well. If not, roll back. If it does go well, roll, on, roll, roll, roll the deployment to the rest of the instances. Uh, so these are the main use cases. Uh, to put things into context, uh, if we compare this to, to the Amazon cloud and where it sits in the OpenStack uh, stack, if you will. Um, so Cloudify kind of sits uh, where AWS Ops Works is, is sitting today, basically sitting on top of the uh, more basic automation tools uh, like Chef or Puppet and allowing you to orchestrate not just the uh, infrastructure components but also the application components and al also handling uh, everything related to the POS deployment. Um, so before I uh, go to the demo, uh, I mentioned uh, the notion of blueprints. Uh, so we're very uh, heavily involved in the Tosca standard. Anyone familiar with it, heard about it? All right, just a few hands here. Uh, so Tosca stands for Topology Orchestration Specification for Cloud Applications, kind of a short, short and simple name to remember. Um, and uh, this is essentially a specification that's led by uh, a standards organization called Oasis, led by IBM, uh, Red Hat, and Rackspace. And we're also part of that uh, organization. It's essentially designed to find a standard way to, defi to define and um, essentially implement a way to uh, configure what an application would look like in a cloud environment. Uh, not just the topology of that application, but also policies uh, and uh, workflows related to that application. 
Uh, and a blueprint essentially describes a topology, and the topology will be everything that's related to your application on the cloud, networks, as you can see here. Uh, for example, this tier is a network, and hosts within it, servers within the host, application modules, connection between, connections between them, and so on. Um, so let's jump to the demo. I'm going to show a kind of a nice uh, sample application that's consisted of, out of Node.js and MongoDB. Uh, so I'm going to switch to the live demo. Hopefully that's going to work. One second. Probably need to mirror my display over here. All right, hopefully this is going to come in a second. Mirror displays. All right. That's good. Okay, so um, this is my application topology. Um, so uh, I've actually what I've done is I bootstrap a Cloudify manager, which is a one-time step you, you need to do when you uh, deploy Cloudify. Like I said, it's an open source project, um, but we have a very easy way to deploy things. This is just a single uh, command, line, uh, uh, command line thing you need to do. Um, and then I uploaded a blueprint. A blueprint essentially is, is a YAML file that describes the application components and all their dependencies. Um, again, I mentioned the Tosca specification. It's kind of based on the Tosca format. Um, once I have this blueprint, I can create deployments off of that. So for example, here we have a deployment. It's kind of similar to the blueprint. And then I can start running actions on top of this blueprint. So in our case, we have an install workflow that basically takes place, traverses this topology, and essentially materializes that uh, within the cloud. Um, the way it materializes that is by sending uh, tasks to a specific uh, agent that runs those tasks and provisions the request. And uh, this is where the logging infrastructure uh, kind of fits into place. This is all taken from Elasticsearch. We basically push all of the logs that are related to the installation and to the materialization of that topology into Elasticsearch. And then you can visualize that, you can query that. These are just standard open source tools that you need to use that we, as an integration platform, wire them up for you. Um, now, just to make sure that everything is running properly, uh, let's have a look at this application. Uh, we can see that we're, it's basically a wine list. So we're browsing the wines, and we can see that what got created under the hood, essentially all the wiring between the database and the web server is, is working because we can see uh, the list here. Uh, now, if I'm looking at the uh, infrastructure side of things and what really happened while I deploy that application is that I had three instances created, one related to the Cloudify manager, and then the other one, the other one's related to the uh, application nodes. Uh, but more interestingly, uh, we have um, other cloud resources created for us. Okay, so if I'm jumping off to security groups, uh, we have one security group that was created for the application, and then another one that was created for Cloudify to communicate, uh, for the manager to communicate with the agents, and then another one uh, for the management itself to communicate uh, between multiple management instances. Um, and then if I'm looking at the networks tab here, um, I can see also that we have a few networks created, one for the application and another, and another one for the uh, administration. So essentially it took care of everything related to the infrastructure uh, that needed to happen for the application to run properly um, on your cloud. Um, so like I mentioned, um, this is all an open source project. Uh, licensed under Apache 2. You heard the, the same from, uh, from Chris Mayers before, uh, uh, from HP Print about them using Cloudify. I actually showed version 3.0 that he was talking about before. Uh, this is an open source, um, deployed. Uh, all, the, all the repositories are, are, are on GitHub and publicly available. And you know, just give it a try. Get Cloudify.org, that's where it is. That's it. So thank you so much to both Gigaspace and Clicker. Does anybody have any questions for either of our pre presenters? Sorry, just come up here to the, the mic so we can all hear you. Uh, who, who are the target users of these applications? Uh, are they App developers, are they cloud administrators, are they network operations guys uh, who get tickets to deploy applications or basically the question is the user using these applications 
what kind of expertise levels they have with respect to applications or networks. And the second question is, are these multi-tenant uh, as well? Okay, so we'll have uh, one minute each to answer your question. Wow, debate style. <laughs> Um, so in Clicker's case, the, the answer can be all of the above. What we see is that uh, folks that are just getting started with our platform, it tends to be like the system administrators and those sorts of folks that are using tooling. But as I mentioned during this sort of the slide per portion of it, we, we see that folks that are getting more advanced use out of it are starting to turn to this IT as a service model. And what happens is the system administrators of the world set up the applications and use the governance features and then expose that to the line of business teams so that right now so that it, it, when you get to that more advanced stage they're not issuing tickets that you have to reply to they're just freaking pushing the buttons and launching the apps man and they're good to go so it's it we, we see it in, in sort of those those two different phases in our case thank you clicker okay yeah so in our case we're seeing uh kind of three types of personas uh, the, the first type is uh actually um IT organizations uh, that essentially define the infrastructure um, constraints, if you will, uh, like what kinds of VMs can be used, what kind of operating system, what kind of networks. Uh, and these are used as building blocks for the application teams. Uh, so I would say that in this case, every application team has their experts, uh, and they are the ones that formulate those blueprints that, again, use those infrastructure components that the IT team has defined. And then the developers or the, use, the ordinary users basically t just take the blueprints off a catalog or off a Git repository and deploy it in a click. Thank you, Kiki Space. Exactly. And, and the publishing, again, it's not, we're, what we're trying to do is not really constrain ourselves to a specific way of managing things. Uh, we're integrating with a Git repository, for example, so you can publish it to GitHub, and then the application teams or the developers consume the blueprints from there. Thank you. Next question? Yeah, so uh, the question is uh, for you uh, on the Cloudify mm -hmm. uh, uh, pitch that you made. Uh, so this is regarding the ongoing lifecycle management for the blueprints, the application blueprints, right? So you provision, you use the blueprints, you provision your apps, and now if something changes in that app, say my mount point changed, and I have 300 VMs running, how do I do that? I mean, what does Cloudify do? Just to solve that problem. Yeah. So um, if, if your app is not running, obviously that's the easy part, or you can just upload, you can change the blueprint in your Git repository and, and upload the blueprint again and create a deployment off of that. If your deployment is already running, uh, essentially what you need to do is, is update the blueprint for that deployment and roll up the changes. Um, in our case, that would be uh, the platform itself is built out of, is consistent out of workflows. So there, there would be a workflow that would react to that event of changing a blueprint, traverse all the nodes and apply the, the changes to them, all the relevant nodes and apply those changes to them. Great, thank you so much. And you didn't ask me, but we do the same thing with our application profiles. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was feeling all left out over here, so I just thought I'd jump into the answer. That's, you know, so, so our application profiles in our, in, in our mechanism are versioned and you can roll them out the exact same way. Um, among the things that you may have noticed splash by when I showed the, the clicking on the details, you can provide update and like backup and restore scripts so that if you wanted to do a rolling rollout of that, you know, it'll back up one node and do the next and do all the stuff that you would think it would do. Any more questions? All right, great. Thank you so much to Clicker and Gigaspace. Thank you. Just as we, uh, we end here, I have a quick note that HP is hiring. You know, as you can see, we're working with a lot of different folks in the ecosystem on OpenStack. We're deploying our own OpenStack instance, providing a one of the biggest, if not the biggest, public cloud deployment for OpenStack. So if you're interested in more, you can head down to the marketplace where you'll find uh, a number of different HP jobs posted, as well as you can talk to a uh, recruiting specialist at our booth. So, be sure to check that out. And if you didn't hear earlier, we're also giving away an HP 10-inch slate at 6 o'clock. So you want to get down there beforehand to get your ticket. But if you don't win tonight, we're also going to be giving away two of those tablets every day for the rest of the week uh, while the marketplace is open. So the ticket that you get tonight is good for the rest of the week. So if you don't win tonight, you'll have another opportunity for sure. And uh, so thank you very much. And I really appreciate your time today. And if you have any further questions, our 
representatives here from Clicker and Gigaspace will be around uh, here at the front to, to answer any further questions you might have. So thank you so much, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your OpenStack.